we've got two amazing presenters today that's going to speak to you about a couple different things. Um, first, we are going to have Michael Ross. Uh, Michael Ross currently serves as the director of two divisions at Indiana's Criminal Justice Institute. As the director of the Behavioral Health Division, Michael oversees the local coordinating councils. As the director of the Youth Division, Michael oversees Title II and School Safe Haven funds. Um, in addition, Michael is a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Indiana. Woohoo, go social workers. Um, Michael, is, uh, Michael currently maintains an active private practice and serves as an expert consultant on matters related to crisis response. Uh, since making in complex social systems and human factors and security, Michael is currently the only behavioral health professional serving on Governor Holcomb's Cybersecurity Council. Michael also serves on several international boards and work groups. Um, Michael possesses a Bachelor of Arts in Esoteric Religious Studies from IU, go IU, um, a Master of Social Work in Mental Health and Addiction from IU School of Social Work, again, go IU School of Social Work, um, a pre-doctoral certificate in Homeland Security and Emergency Management from Indiana University School of Public and Environmental Affairs. In addition, Michael is currently a PhD candidate in social psychology. Um, with a proposed dissertation of Towards a Model, Leveraging Inoculation Theory to Build a Cognitive Public Health Model for Dialectical Prophylaxis Against Disinformation Campaigns. In his spare time, Michael competes in powerlifting. Uh, Michael is a proud father of two daughters and has been married to his best friend since 2009. Um, next, we have Brandon George. Um, Brandon George is the Vice President for Recovery, Advocacy, and Programs for Mental Health America, Indiana, and the Director of Indiana Addiction Issues Coalition, which advocates for recovery through public health and uh, public policy and education. As a person in long-term recovery, Brandon dedicates his time personally and professionally to fighting addiction and promoting recovery. So, like I said, we have two amazing presenters today. Um, so, Michael, if you'd like, you can go ahead and um, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and just happy to see as many of you on this call as are here. So I'm just going to be giving a brief kind of overview of what to look for from the Behavioral Health Division and, and about the next year to year and a half and, and how our, our thinking continues to evolve. Um, I think we're in a very good place overall, functionally and structurally for the local coordinating councils. Um, and as we continue to better understand what makes you all effective uh, and what support you need, we'll be able to pivot towards those items. Uh, we are excited that we are going to be releasing, hopefully in the next month and a half, uh, once it gets through our internal editing process, our first ever end of year report which is a summary of both the financial health, uh, functional health, and overall structure of local coordinating councils in the state of Indiana. Uh, this was something that was an important um, project for me when I took over three years ago, and we've been waylaid a couple times with both the pandemic and other items, but I think we're finally at a good place. Uh, what I described it as initially to my staff was I really wanted baseball cards for each one of the counties, uh, that if you wanted to know what was happening in that county, you could look. Um, I think we didn't quite hit that on the head, but I think what we have is a good start to getting there, and I think it will evolve over time. Um, it will also help us move towards creating eventually a dashboard uh, for you all that will allow you all to be able to look uh, via a Tableau visualizer uh, at a map of Indiana, click on those, and understand what's going on overall. So I think uh, good news there, and we're excited about that. Once we have it, uh, in viewable form, it will obviously be posted on our website and it will come out to all of you. Uh, we will also be sharing it with the commission and uh, not the Q1 meeting, but most likely the Q2 meeting of this year. So we're excited about that. Um, other items before I jump into this presentation that I really quickly wanna make you aware of is in um, late April, May, we'll be releasing a solicitation for school safe haven funds. And as many of you know, and as many of you have uh, school representatives on your councils, 
uh, it's important to understand the importance of bullying prevention and mitigation as that relates to the prevention of other issues over the lifespan. Um, so once we have that RFP ready, it will be coming out, but I do believe it's something that many of you or some of your school partners within your county could benefit from. So please do take a look at that when it comes out and we'll make sure that um, Corey or Sadia does send that out to you all via the behavioral health email once it is ready. So without further ado, let's jump into my presentation. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is how do we transition from stability, right? Because that was our first focus for the first three years is to create a unified framework and a stability for you all to be able to do that good work at the local level. And then how do we move forward from there and how do we do it in a measured um, but beneficial way? Well, let's see, click. How do I advance? There we go, all, all right. So um, when we think about this and, and we think about it in a focused way, we wanna create environments for the development and maintenance of healthy, holistic and responsive systems that create opportunities for growth and recovery, right? I, I mean, at the end of the day, that is what you all are wanting to do. We also wanna ensure that there are mul multiple and holistic response avenues for youth to move towards growth and recovery, right? So hopefully that upstream prevention uh, does its job and you all can make progress generationally. So when we think about processes, we typically think about them in cycles or patterns. Um, you know, we all should be keenly aware that addiction and mental health related issues are typically nonlinear. Uh, so these are things that while you may be able to track progress, uh, there is often a backwards movement as well, and not necessarily in a negative or punitive way, but right, sometimes steps backwards do occur. So when we're thinking about cycles too, we wanna think about them in a nonlinear constant process. So right, we wanna identify opportunities uh, in our process or in our workflow to seek and improve, right? And, and in some ways, that's what your comprehensive community plan is intended to do. That's why we wanted to make it a living document, right? Because then the impetus is on you all to really reflect on, are we making the impact that we want? And if not, how do we improve that, right? And then you plan, right? So you update your comprehensive community plan. You have discussions throughout the year of, are we making the impact that we'd like? Are we effectively funding programs that are having an impact? Are we even aware of the impact that our programs are having? Um, or do we just give money out and we never see it again and it never, we never know what happens with it, um, right? Then you execute, right? So, so you wanna see those plans turn into actions, right? Which hopefully drive solutions or change. And then you review, right? This can be at the end of the year, this can be biannually, this can be you know, three, every three years, it, it depends on what you're looking at, right? Um, but a healthy and, and consistent review process is important to both making change over a long term, but also deciding if the change that you've selected is actually the correct change, right? Because we exist in complex social systems where it's not easy or even sometimes possible to determine what is causal. So, just a breakdown of this process as simply as I, I, I can lay it out, right? So we wanna follow the scientific method. So we, we wanna be curious, we wanna look for facts, we wanna test our thinking and our hypothesis, and we wanna challenge ourselves if we're wrong or we're holding a, a belief that has that just existed historically. Um, and, and it's important to do that. We wanna be self-critical, right? So it's important to challenge ourselves on what we're doing well, but it's also important to be able to identify what we're not doing well so we can work to improve it, not to shame ourselves, but to identify how can we improve. Uh, ensure a third party verification. So I recognize there's, there's different capacity across the state, but those counties that do have the funds or the capacity to have, have a third party evaluator uh, look at both their data and how they're functioning, that's always important. Uh, if that's not important, identifying an individual that can serve as that expert on a volunteer basis or in some other other form or function. Uh, and if nothing else, creating a work group that can serve as a, uh, a validation and verification work group for your approach. And again, this is this varies across capacity. So it's not so easy to say everybody should do this. 
uh, ensure that all actions are evaluated and reported back to the larger group, right? So, so context, context, context. Context is key. It's very easy for us to use that catchphrase, local knowledge or local solutions. But if you're not capturing that and you're not articulating it and you're not explaining why this is unique to you and your county, it, it becomes very hard for somebody else to come along and go, oh, we understand why you're doing that. So it's important to report things back to the larger group, not only at your local level, um, but also up to us so that we can either celebrate or share what innovations you're uh, doing or why something might not work for you that works for others. And again, there can be leniency in that at times, but sometimes in order to have a functional framework, you have to have lanes and have a framework. Um, create opportunities for process redesign on an annual and biannual basis. For us, what this looks like is the form formation of an advisory group of LCC coordinators um, from across the state and having them advise us on our processes and our approaches and our ways of thinking. Um, and for us, that's important, right? Because we wanna make sure what we're doing is beneficial to you. I have some innate knowledge. I have some experience. My staff has experience. We can look at literature. We can look at best practices. But again, right, we exist in complex social systems where one change may seem logical, but cause a lot of back-end issues. And sometimes those back-end issues are necessary because the system has to uh, course correct itself, but sometimes there are just unintentional consequence, consequences that have to be addressed. Um, so this is the next piece. I'm gonna focus a little bit on this at, for the majority of the presentation is adopt the Kinevin framework. Um, so this is a framework that I'm trained in, um, that I'm a tremendous fan of. Uh, I suspect many of you have not heard of it. Um, but it is internationally acknowledged and it's been used by the Department of Defense, uh, a lot of Fortune 500 companies, and it's pronounced Kinevin, um, and it comes from a Welsh word. Um, so what does this process look like? Again, we, we need to visualize our work, right? We, we exist in a world where data is rich, information is rich. You could get lost in the internet rabbit hole and spend hours trying to read PDF documents on prevention or addiction, or even state reports from the state of Indiana. So, so it's important that you, you create your data in a way that makes it digestible, because the vast majority of people have somewhere between 30 seconds to a minute of it, attention that you have to grab to then get them to actually engage with your material. Otherwise, they look at it, they go, this is too big, I don't have time to read this, I'm going to save it for later, and then they actually probably never read it later, or it sits in their email and they've actually never opened the file. So so visualizing work is incredibly important. Um, limit work and process. So right, if you're trying to make long-term achievable goals that you can actually take action on, if you have 20 goals, it's gonna be a lot harder to achieve those. So keep those narrowed down and really hyper-focus them. Manage your flow, right? So you need to have processes. If, if you're just haphazard and you're chaotic, chaotic and you have no structure and you have no organization for how you think and you just say this is how we've always done it we're just going to show up we're going to talk and then go go away you're probably not going to be effective maybe you are um, but in most instances you're probably not going to be effective uh, you need to make your local policies and practices explicit just as we've tried to do with our manual and other efforts and that's not for us to try to be overly bureaucratic um, and I, I think, you know, we try to stay out of your hair as much as possible, but you have to create a framework, right? You have to have that bowling alley so that people can bowl. And, and our hope is that, you know, we can create those bumpers so that you guys can have a lot of fun at, you know, midnight bowling and, and worry about all the good times as opposed to all the other issues. Um, the next one's in red. It is okay to occasionally break the rules. Um, now it's in red because the the items that guide you all, right? The 25% that has to go here, the 25% that has to go to prevention, education, treatment, you can't break those. Those, those are, are, are laws and binding. Um, but there are nuances in how you think and other items that maybe policies or rules that we've put in place or others have put in place that need to be challenged or you need to ask questions about them. And so if a system's not functioning or it's breaking, it's important to have that conversation of, is this rule worth breaking and why? And how, how do we go about that? And what are the consequences? Um, you should never engage in that process without having a long, robust system that allows you to think through what are the consequences and benefits of breaking that. So 
again, our focus here has been evolutionary rather than re revolutionary. We don't want to blow the system up. We didn't want to break it. We wanted to create evolutionary structure to allow you all to move forward um, so that we could actually start trying to address some of the functional problems that you all encounter in a way that's actually meaningful. Um, you know, we try to take processes and policies on as a team. And we try to think about them in ways that allow us to continuously improve. And we try to hear what your frustrations are. And we try to then make adjustments both to our manual and other documents to, to deal with that. There are some items that we can't, um, right? That might be the, the grant management program platform that we currently use, right? That's, that's contracted out. We, we can't make significant changes to that. Um, you know, but we also try to create the environment necessarily for you all to self-organize as teams and evolve yourself over time, right? It's not helpful for us to come along and say, no, 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 this is exactly how you should do this. There are instances where that's necessary, but again, right? Local knowledge, local solutions, you guys are self-organizing teams in a complex social system. So at the end of the day, we want to manage change. Um, for a couple different reasons. We wanna see it succeed, um, but we also don't wanna break the system and we don't want you all to hate us or, or hate the changes. Um, and, and we try to do this in manageable ways um, because again, people typically do not like changes that are externally, externally um, forced on them and they don't understand the context of it. So I mentioned this framework and I only have, I think two more slides here, um, but it's important to understand this. So. I uh, think the, the Kinevin framework is a conceptual framework used to aid in decision making. It was created in 1999 by Dave Snowden uh, when he worked at IBM Global Services. It has been described as a sense making device. Uh, Kinevin, pronounced Kinevin, is a Welsh word that signifies the multiple intertwined factors in our environment and our experience that influences us how we think, interpret, and act in ways we can never fully understand. For anybody that's been around this work for a long time, this probably resonates with you. Um, and one of the things that often can be a challenge is, well, we had something that was good and then it moved into a, a non-functional period. Why did that happen? So this framework creates states of being. And because we exist in complex interconnected social systems, we have to have a model that allows for us to understand that something is not static, that it can move right from one domain to the next. Uh, and our need to think about it can move from clear to complicated, right? So external factors may, may move something from being very clear and easy to then suddenly being complicated. And this framework gives us a good method for understanding what our decision process should be, right? So for instance, if it's in complicated, we would sense, so we try to understand by collecting data or listening to peers or whatever it is, then we'd analyze what we, we collected and that could be formal analysis or that could be conversation and then we could respond. And again, the key here is good practice. What is good practice? It's not best practice, but it's the best practice that you can achieve with the constraints that you currently have. So uh, I'm a big fan of this framework. Uh, we're gonna be looking to bring, tr bring training for this to you all over the course of the next year. Um, and it will help, I think, you all think through how do you facilitate complicated thinking in your communities. Um, the other benefit of this is it allows you to build human sensor networks. This is something many of you have been doing just naturally for the last several years, or even since the formation of the local coordinating councils. Uh, as a definition though, a human sensor network provides real-time feedback, which is essential to managing complexity and can be used to help identify potential solutions to be explored, tested, and monitored. Networks created for ordinary monitoring or exploration can then be developed in times of extraordinary need. For instance, let's say a hepatitis outbreak or right, COVID-19, when a natural disaster or pandemic hits, a trusted network providing a real-time situational assessment might be readily available to deploy it or tap into. So you all naturally, by the formation and construction of the local coordinating council, have a human sensor network at your hands, but you may not be effectively using it or thinking about it in that way. Human sensor networks are the key, the key, and there's a tremendous amount of literature on this, are the key to gaining a greater understanding of our democracies and our communities. 
continuous engagement with citizens leads to more trust and thus more co cooperation, right? Like it, that's something that's again, probably pretty clear to all of you. So what does this look like? Math consult co consultation with real-time feedback, localized sense making. So right, understanding the local impact and that could be the county level or that could be the community level. Taking stock to take action, bridging the gap or gaps that we find. It's people focused, so right, people are the sensors. People are the data sources. Uh, radical repurposing in times of crisis, so it allows you to quickly take the system you've built and adapt it and get really good viable information. Uh, allows us to pay attention to blind spots or what professionals or experts have determined it are areas that we should focus on, right? You often may find something that might be somewhat parallel to that, but might be the adjacent possible. Further engaging communities and sense making. So it gives community level ownership. So there is a tool for this. And again, once we get that training, our hope is to be able to bring this tool uh, and license it for you all to be able to use. And some of you may not have the capacity to use it. And we totally get that and appreciate that, but we want to bring it so that it's available. Um, so SenseMaker is the tool that allows for the, the Kinevin framework to then be visualized. And think of this as if you had an iPad and you held your finger down on this triangle and you moved it around, those dots capture your thinking about an issue, right? So you have the triad, so you could go, improves well-being. Yeah, I think so. Oh, no, it delivers economic growth. Oh, it gives people freedom to do what they want. So it captures uh, a psychological topography, topography or cognitive topography in relation to an issue, which allows for more nuanced thinking uh, in ways that existing static data sets just do not. So SenseMaker supports participative processes of collective inquiry and shared sense making, and has been used for monitoring and evaluation, impact assessment, and the facilitation of complex development and social intervention planning across various disciplines and sectors. So I, we're very excited about what the next thing will be. And we're very excited that it won't be overwhelming and it will be available for those that want to adapt it. And for those that A, don't have the capacity or bandwidth, we can help try to get you there as best as possible. Um, but we do believe that the framework as a whole um, is a, just a different way of thinking and seeing the world. And that does not require much time at all. It just requires the attendance in a workshop and then you can approach issues from a different perspective. So again, I think we're excited about the future. We're excited about what we're putting in place. Um, and I think, yeah, and I've got references. So, I'll have um, these slides sent over uh, and then ensure that they're emailed out to all of you. And if you all have any questions, you can all always reach out to me, but I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, yes, those slides will be available on the Coalition Network website, um, just like the other slides and just like this video will be as well. Um, go ahead and hang on to your questions. Um, we will go ahead and get the legislative update from Brandon. And then at the end, we can go ahead and make sure everybody gets their questions answered. So Brandon, if you wanna take it away. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much for having me on. I've always got the most, you know, this is like the most difficult seat in the house going behind Michael Ross. Like, I don't ever want to sign up for this again. I think I've had to do that during testimony before, and it's no fun either. So, um, it's really neat. I like being, uh, seeing you all, uh, the LCC network, the ICN, um, just because I'm reminded of the amazing work that you guys are doing in, in the community and really serving as a, a group that pulls folks together and watching Michael go through that presentation um, on ways that, you know, we can constantly grow and develop and uh, figure out what we're doing really, really well and, and focus on that. Um, you know, and part of that ties into, uh, you know, legislation, right? You guys are really focused on the front line, making sure um, that programs are put into place, good folks are funded, et cetera, uh, within your communities and your counties. Um, but sometimes you run into things um, that prevent us from doing that, right? Policy. And so I always talk about change happening from both the bottom up, from grassroots up, but also from the top down, um, because at some point we need policy to clear the way. And so uh, I want to give a few legislative updates, both uh, for state policy and federal policy. Um, the good news um, for you all and not having to listen to me too much is that this is a non-budget year. 
Um, for those of you guys that are not familiar, Indiana does a budget on a biannual basis, uh, meaning that every other year. Um, and so the budget is laid out for a full two years. And so in these non-budget years, um, there's no new money. And so you can't go to the state. Agencies can't go there looking for uh, project money, et cetera. And so these off years really end up being a lot about administrative changes um, and changes to existing things that happened either last year and the years before that need to be cleaned up, expanded, et cetera. And that's what we're seeing a lot of this year. Um, one of those things that, that most folks care about, um, both personally, probably professionally as well, is telehealth. Um, Indiana really had some archaic telehealth laws in place prior to COVID. Um, pretty much, unless you were a psychiatrist or a psychologist, you couldn't get reimbursed for telehealth. COVID-19 pushed us forward because the governor's emergency de declaration, he essentially said, hey, anybody that provides services can also do so telehealth-wise and get reimbursed for it. Um, well, his emergency order expired. Uh, last year, the, the, the legislature did update our telehealth law. Um, to expand the folks that could provide telehealth services um, to licensed individuals. And that's great. It was a really good starting point. Um, so you think about doctors um, and nurses and licensed clinical social workers, et cetera. If you hold an IPLA license, you can provide telehealth services and be reimbursed. Unfortunately, when it comes to addiction and mental health, when somebody has a full treatment plan, um, you know, for every one time they see a licensed provider, they probably see somebody else six times, right? A peer recovery coach, a case manager, all these other services that are not covered right now during tele or during the, the current telehealth law. And so Senate Bill 84, um, I'm sorry, Senate Bill 284 <clears throat> goes after that. Um, it did pass out of Senate Health. Um, the language we wanted to add for certified individuals did not get put in um, on the Senate side, but we hope that it will on the House side. Um, the conversation so far is really centered around this idea that, yes, we need to expand, um, but it's another area that folks take advantage of, um, and we got to be cognizant of it because, uh, for instance, we had chiropractors showing up that wanted to be included on the new telehealth law. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I don't know exactly how a chiropractor is going to adjust me through a screen, right? And so um, you've got some folks that probably really shouldn't be doing it, trying to. And so um, work's being done there. We think it will get expanded. And so uh, keep an eye out as session continues. Um, break is next week, just to FYI for the halfway point. Um, House Bill 1193, opioid litigation. Um, for those of you that do not know, um, we are... Um, trying to finalize opioid litigation um, and how it's going to unfold. Last year, we created an opioid litigation fund and so that when the state receives money, we have somewhere to actually put it at and trying to create a process in which that money will be distributed. Um, and uh, it's a very, very complicated process that involves all the communities opting in and becoming part of the state plan or going it alone. And so I'm not going to get into all the details, but essentially what 1193 does was it allows counties to opt into the state plan um, for a, a longer amount of time. The previous deadline was in September and we only had about half the county sign up, which is disappointing because if less than half of them sign up, we get about half the money. And so Indiana should get about $550 million, just so you know. As it sits as of September, we'll only collect about $250 million because only about half of our municipalities, towns, et cetera, has signed up to be part of our agreement, the master settlement. So um, we're hoping that some more communities add on there so Indiana doesn't lose money. Um, the problem with that is the communities think if they add on to it or they sign on to it, that they're going to lose some flexibility uh, over money. They, they would rather receive it directly, which we understand and we're sympathetic to. Um, but number one, we want to make sure we don't have a replay of the tobacco settlement money where none of that money got to, people who, got to the people who were affected. Like it went to everything except for folks that were affected by tobacco. And so we want to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, we have been involved in some uh, national efforts on this topic. Um, we were involved with a work group that Georgetown Law put together that involved the general counsel um, from the uh, Office of National Drug Control Policy and the new director of SAMHSA to come up with some best practices. Um, so if anybody has... Um, if anybody is in communication with their mayor, town council, county council, 
on how you guys, uh, how, on how this money is going to be spent when they receive it and need support, please reach out to me individually. Um, you can reach out to the team from the ICN. They can put you in contact, but I'm happy to um, get that together. Nicole, I see a, a question coming in. There's actually a list um, that we put together and sent out. We can send that out. Um, I will get this. I'll get it over to the team and have them send it out to the group so you can see if you're opted in or opted out. Um, we made a push to try to really let folks know, hey, if your county's not opted in, please do so. Um, and again, this is about just making sure this money, one, Indiana gets as much money as possible, and two, that it actually gets spent on programs that have to do with substance use disorder and mental health. And so um, we can let you know who is, who isn't. We can give you tools for advocating um, the position and then if your community does want to do it alone, we can also provide some information on what are some of the best ways to utilize some of these resources. You know, the hope is, is we'll get a bunch of money up front as a state, and then we'll get another 10 to 15 million a year for about 15 years. And so it's going to be an ongoing funding stream for some time. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of communities that are trying to use this money to just like build new city halls. They're like, hey, uh, we want you, we need to new, build a new morgue because a lot of people died. And like, that's really not what this money is intended for. And those plans, it's not, it's not rhetoric. Like people have literally put those plans on paper and submitted them to state officials. And so if you're in this space and you are involved in this, which everybody on this call is in, in their community, please be an advocate on this topic. We have to make sure at a local level, this money does not go just to roads and bridges. It really needs to, this can be funding for organizations like you all for the next 15 years. So you have a, should have a big seat at the table um, and happy to continue conversation about this topic. Uh, Brandon, yes. we, we had another question. Um, it says, uh, who in the counties is responsible for opting into the state settlement? Whoever the, the, the authority in the town, county, or municipality is. And so it goes down in layers, it goes county, city, and town. So your county council is going to be one of them. The mayor would be one of those. Those are the two places I would start. Um, city councils possibly as well, but those three entities, county uh, commissioners, city councils, and mayors will be heavily involved in it. And you all are the resident experts in your community. Um, the other piece to me is if you're not involved in it, like I don't want to be an antagonist, antagonist here, but kind of shame on them. Like you guys should be involved in this. And if you're not, who is the local expert that's helping make these decisions? Like who's sitting around the table coming up with a plan on how this money is going to be spent if it's not you all. Um, and that's not, again, that's not to antagonize you all or get you, you know, amped up. Um, but it's a legitimate question um, because other people have other motives. They have different missions. You know, the, 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 you know, the, the goal of, of what you all do is specifically in this area. So um, that's who I would start with. Um, and again, we're happy to help out. We've got a team member specifically at IAIC, Andrew, San Andrew, Andrew Sanders, that is uh, helping out on this topic. Um, again, that we're working both with some federal partners and state partners um, on this. So um, it's gonna be a topic in the coming months. So please reach out if you need anything. All right, um, House Bill 1141 was a mental health bill that was introduced by Vermillion uh, and Vermillion. Um, and it does a couple of things. One, uh, you guys, most of you know that when you go to jail, your Medicaid gets cut off, which is uh, kind of archaic in the sense that, um, you know, the county has to pick up the tab for all healthcare services while people are in jail. And it ends up being the biggest expense of that county. Um, and 75% of people that are in county jails are, have not been convicted of a crime. So um, they don't have access to health resources while there. This bill um, would require um, the state to apply for a waiver that would allow folks to uh, activate their Medicaid about 30 days prior to release and would allow them to start receiving services through Medicaid. We think this is, there's a federal rule that prohibits this right now, um, but they're making some exceptions to it. Kentucky is one of them. And so this bill would um, ask the state essentially to apply for uh, a similar waiver. And then it also um, makes the plan, uh, the Division of Mental Health and Addiction establish a plan to expand the use of what we call CCBHCs. Those are Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics. And uh, to try to keep it simpler, it, it, it allows the uh, mental health providers to do work outside of their four walls 
um, outside of traditional like CMHC system and at a best practice. So there's several of them. Um, the federal government's provided funding to, I think, 15 in, in the state of Indiana. Um, and they're going to expand federally. They want to do this more. They see this as a new way to deliver services. Um, if you're not familiar with the CC HBCs, you should, uh, we, we should do so um, just so everybody is kind of in the know of what they are. So this bill would make the state essentially develop a plan for that, how they're going to make better use of this. That bill did pass, just so you guys know, out of house health, but it's been recommitted to Ways and Means, the financial folks, um, because of the Medicaid piece for DOC will have a, a financial implication to it. So 1141 for Medicaid and DOC and uh, the CCHBCs, opioid litigation in 1193, uh, and then the Senate telehealth bill 284 are the biggest ones. There's also Senate... Senate Bill 6 and 10, which are uh, what they're calling a crime package um, that came out of the criminal code, which is it's focused on Marion County, but the legislature doesn't govern counties. They govern our whole state. And so this is a response to the increased crime in Marion County, but it's going to be applicable across the state. Part of it, Senate Bill 10, will create some funding for pilot projects um, to help reduce crime. Um, we've got an amendment added, Crider, Senator Crider helped add it. So it's not just local police departments that uh, can access the funds, but our, um, our churches and nonprofits, et cetera, um, that can also help with the reduction of violent crimes through other programs that aren't law enforcement related, that are more behavioral health and mental health related. So I think that's it. Um, there's a couple other things uh, around prescription drug rebates and trying to get our psychologists into compacts so they can practice in other states, but I'm not going to go into detail there. Um, federally, uh, just one thing of note, uh, the, the budget has not been passed for fiscal year 2022. And um, essentially when that's the case, they just operate um, off last year's budget. So right now we're three months into the new fiscal year federally, started October 1st for anybody that receives uh, federal money and we're operating off last year's budget still and that's important because the new budget has a lot of new funding in there for mental health behavioral health etc um, it has an increase in block grant dollars from 1.8 million up to 1.6 billion up to almost 3.5 billion so it's a, a almost doubling it's 80 percent increase in block grant dollars going to states and it also includes a first of its kind recovery set aside um, so if most of you all know uh, in the prevention world that when the block grant dollars come in, 20% of that money is set aside for prevention. And that's helped us develop amazing prevention networks and infrastructure in our state. Well, we don't have that set aside for recovery. Um, it's just essentially we got to pull it away from that larger bucket. And so the budgets that are put forward by the president, by the House and by the Senate all include a 10% recovery set aside. So the block grant dollars would come, 20% would go to prevention. 10% would go to recovery, and then the other 70% could be used on treatment or other programs that each state deem necessary. Currently, that would be $350 million dedicated to recovery services um, across the country. So um, we really need that budget to pass to get this increased funding levels um, for both overall mental health or behavioral health and for recovery specifically. So I'm going to stop there. Um, We'll take questions here in a second overall, but uh, as always, just please reach out if anybody needs uh, additional information or if they wanna be involved in the legislative process, I encourage that. Um, we should know how our government works. We should know how policy works in the work that we do. So thank you all. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Brandon, for those updates. I know that's really helpful for us to know what's going on in the state. Um, but we did have a question in the chat. Someone asked what the, uh, last two bill numbers were, if you could repeat those. Absolutely. So a couple of things that I mentioned last, I think the, the crime package bills were Senate Bill 10 and Senate Bill 6. The opioid litigation bill was 1193. And the mental health bill that has the uh, Medicaid for DOC and the CCHBCs were 1141. Telehealth bill was 284. I think that's about all of them that I covered. Okay, so we can open up um, 
back to Michael and Brandon both if anyone has any questions um, regarding either presentation. If you want to put those in the chat or just unmute and ask, uh, feel free. Michael, uh, I have a question. Um, this uh, new framework, uh, what is it? Kenefin? 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 Um, is it going to be uh, a requirement or is it going to be optional or what level of, uh, you know, what level of uh, implementation are we going to have at the local level? Yeah, that's a really good question, Chuck. Um, so, uh, and it took me forever to figure out how to pronounce it too, right? The, Wel the Welsh words are always challenging. Uh, so think of it, uh, like Kevin, but like uh, you're sneezing and saying Kevin. Um, so ideally it will be, so it will be expected that all of us internally think in this way. Um, the training will not be mandatory when we get it set up for everybody, but it will be available to everyone. Um, most of the resources that are out there for it are free. There are books you can buy on it. And so you, you know, if you have a greater interest, you could already start thinking through it and employing it. Um, but we are not, so none of our documents, anything is going to change and say, are you using this framework or not? Um, it connects to everything you're already doing. So it should be just really easy to just kind of change. The, the only difference really in the grand scheme of things is instead of thinking the world in one way, it gives you four sort of analytical devices for saying our system or this issue exists within this domain. So we need to tackle it from this perspective. It just gives you some ways of thinking about complex social systems that, that we just don't currently use. Um, but outside of that, no, there will be no requirement. Um, you know, we recognize that some of the lower LCCs do a lot with very little, and some of the big ones do a lot with a lot. But we, we want to try to give you all tools that, that will expand your ability without necessarily expanding work. So. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions for Michael or Brandon? Well, this isn't really a question, but just more of a comment on the opioid settlement funding. I know if for tobacco prevention, Indiana, I think in 2020 received $130 million from the master settlement agreement and tobacco prevention and cessation received 7.5 million out of that 130 million. Um, are there any thoughts going into that of how that's going to be addressed to make sure that that funding is going to the right places? So the money that came in for tobacco cessation, is that uh, from prevention, is that through HHS? So you said it through settlement dollars? Yes, yeah, yeah, through the master settlement agreement. So I'm not aware. I don't want to misspeak on it. Um, that was not, um, I, th I may have had a misunderstanding where that funding came from because I did not think that that was settlement money. And again, mm -hmm. I, it's not me um, saying mine is right, but it, it clearly tells me that I, I, I'm missing a piece of information somewhere. So I don't want to comment on it. I can figure that out. Um, the, the, the body that's delivering it um, will have the answers to that. Do you know who it's coming through? Almost all the stuff. Michael Ross, do you know that? So I, I think in this regard, she's referring to the historical 1980s uh, tobacco settlement yeah. and the, the money that has sort of been paid out of that. I believe, and again, I, I, I want to be very careful because I can't comment on, on things politically, um, but I believe that that money goes to the State Department of Health. Uh, and then the remainder uh, was pre-carved out way back in the day. And, and it's just, it's just based in fractions of it goes here, it goes there, as opposed to there's much discretion. Correct. So that, so I, I guess that helps clarify too. And, 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 and so I, I think one of those things is it goes to different pieces of the budget, uh, like fractions of it out to different spaces. And I think it was law actually passed with the original settlement that dictates it. And there is the sum that goes to, I didn't know if it was DMHA or DOH that, that does get a portion of that. He's right, DOH, but that's been settled a long, long, long time ago. And that's kind of what we're trying to avoid, right? Like we want to make sure that this is more directly going to communities and goes um, like the current setup, it would go, I think 65% would go to DMHA for treatment, recovery, and programs. 
10% to the attorney general and then like 25% to the straight to the local community. So they would have some control over it. But the the majority of it would be ran through like quote unquote experts, right? Like we need people who are experts in this space delivering the money and it not just being parsed out to different line items in the budget, like you know, roads. I don't want to pick on roads. I like roads. I'm just saying I want the money to go somewhere else. All right. Thanks again, guys. Um, do we have any updates or any other updates from ICJI? Yeah, I can provide those. This is Corey here. Um, so I'll keep it real short and simple. Uh, just give you an update on quarterly reports. So the second quarter um, of the Q2 reports that were submitted on October 15th, those have all been reviewed and feedback have, it should have been sent out to every single county that submitted a report. Um, we are currently going through the Q3 reports um, and those that was due January 15th. So kind of just to get an understanding of how things work uh, from our end of things. So really, we review all the reports that are turned into us, but we actually provide formal feedback to the LCCs on our second quarter and the end of year. So although you may not receive feedback on the Q3, Q3 report, we do review those. Now, if there is a potential issue that arises on the, the third quarter report, then you might receive some feedback from us. When I say potential issue, I mean, hey, we're in the almost last quarter of the year uh, and you haven't awarded any dollars yet. You know, what's going on with that? That's, you know, give us, give us, some, uh, give us some feedback on, on why you haven't done that. So that'd be the only time that you'll receive like uh, uh, a feedback from us with the Q3 report. Um, also, let's see here. Speaking of reports, the end of year report, as you all should know, uh, we changed the date from that being April 15th now that submission date is on May 1st. So that will cover basically the whole entire year. Uh, and there is a specific form that will be distributed to you all shortly, probably in the next couple of, probably in the next month, uh, so that you all know what to expect from that. It has not changed from last year's end of year report. So that template is exactly the same. Uh, also, the 2022 CCP is going to be due on April 1st, so you should be having discussions with your LCC about how you want to update that. Um, also, uh, we are currently updating the CCP tutorial PowerPoint presentation, and we're going to have that video recorded and be available on our website hopefully next week. Uh, we'll send an announcement out about that when that information is out. We will also send out a CCP checklist, update checklist to you all. Uh, and that should be coming out next week as well. So that is all the updates that I have. Um, so if you have any questions, reach out to Sadia or myself. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, that about wraps it up. If you um, are on uh, the call. Katie, Katie um, excuse me. There's a question from Teresa so asking when does oh. uh, Q1 start? So if you all don't know this, I hope you all know this, but uh, <laughs> the, the submission calendar year goes from April 1st of 2022, this upcoming one, April 1st of 2022 to March 31st of 2023, mm -hmm. okay? That calendar was chosen by LCC coordinators when we sent a survey out back in late 2019. And we had a unanimous decision, not unanimous, I'm sorry, a majority decision uh, that that is the specific calendar period that you all wanted. Uh, and that was chosen. We heard from a lot of folks, the reason why they chose that is because it's offset from the state fiscal year and also federal fiscal year. So that way they're not having to produce a bunch of documents all at once. So yes, Q1 will start on April 1st, okay? If you have any questions about your calendar, reach out to your program manager, Sadia or myself, and we'd be happy to have a further, a more detailed discussion with you on it, okay? Thank you for catching that question, Allie. All right, so, um, oh, Michael, did you have a comment? Yeah, no, that just made me, made me think. So one of the things we did uh, update was our survey window. Um, and thank you for the participation. It was the highest level of participation we've ever had. Uh, we got some really good data and we ask a bunch of new questions. 
Um, but, you know, we're always open to any questions or items that you all think we need to include of the greater body to get that perspective. Uh, you know, and so if there are any ever functional items like, hey, is this calendar window working? Is this correct? Um, we can always ask those again. Um, you know, we would hesitate to ever change it because it is a massive thing. But, but again, if there are ever any larger body concerns, we can absolutely administer those uh, as questions during our annual survey, which again, we moved because we, we realized that there was a lot happening within the window that we we're sending out the survey. Uh, and it, it seemed to have the effect that we wanted, which was a, a massive increase in participation. So again, thank you everybody for, for doing that. Yeah, so um, getting ready to wrap things up. If you are in our webinar today and you are not um, onboarded in the coalition network, please let us know. We can get you onboarded if you're not sure. Um, feel free to ask us, we can check for you. Um, and share with any DFCs that you know if they are not onboarded. Um, we really want to make sure that you all have access to all of the different resources that we offer and all the collaboration functions on the coalition uh, website, coalition network website. Um, after, other than that, we will stay um, on. Oh, go yeah. ahead, Ali. Also, um, the survey where, that we sent out regarding uh, proposals or um, of topics for the rest of the year on our webinars is still open. So you, you should have the link or we will resend the link in our next um, communication. That helps us a lot to give you relevant topics. Definitely, thank you. So um, we are going to start, if you were on our call in December, we mentioned it, but we are going to start every month when we finish the webinar, we are going to stay on the Coalition Network Management Team. We'll stay on after the webinar to offer technical support if you would like to get signed up or um, onboarded. Um, this would be a great time to do it or if you have any other questions or need support. Um, please stay on and we will assist you. Other than that, our next uh, webinar is going to be in February. It's February 24th, I believe, at noon. Um, we will send that link out to you. Uh, it will be on harm reduction and we really hope to see you there. Um, if you would like to stay on, please go ahead and ask us your questions. And thank you again to Michael and Brandon. Thanks, Michael and Brandon.